In this SY4 screencast, we're going to take a look at dependency theory. And this is the third of four world sociology theories that we're using as the building blocks of this particular topic. Now, the dependency theory perspective on development and global inequalities is very different to both modernization theory and neoliberalism. Because both of those theories focus primarily on the internal barriers to development. Dependency theory, in contrast, focuses much more on the external causes of underdevelopment. And their main argument is that the high income countries in the global north, who represent the core of the global capitalist system, have systematically impoverished uh, the low income developing countries that make up the periphery of the global economy. And according to dependency theorists, this destructive, exploitative process extends back for centuries and continues in the present day. Dependency theory is essentially a Marxist theory of development. And just as Marxists argue that within a capitalist economy, you've got a small group, a capitalist class, who exploit a much bigger group, the working class, they argue that there's a similar uh, exploitative system of stratification if we look at the relationship between countries. So you've got a small group of core nations, uh, what we've called the minority world, mainly concentrated in the global north, who exploit a much bigger group of nations, a kind of periphery group of nations that we've called the majority world. And the main name to try and remember when you're talking about this perspective in the exam is André Gunder Frank, who was half German, half American, uh, but spent a lot of his career uh, working as an economic advisor in South America. For example, he was a key economic advisor to the Allende uh, regime in Chile. And dependency theory is perhaps the most radical perspective on global inequality uh, in terms of its kind of left-wing uh, ideological orientation. According to Frank, three stages of exploitation can be identified throughout history. So let's look at this first phase of mercantile capitalism that emerged during the 15th and 16th centuries. So during this first phase, European explorers such as Christopher Columbus began to establish trading outposts in the southern hemisphere. And this led them to encounter many societies which rivaled medieval Europe in terms of their economic development and cultural sophistication. However, the Europeans had two main advantages over these other civilizations. Firstly, their superior military technology. And then secondly, the Europeans had another weapon that was even more deadly that they weren't even aware of. And this secret weapon was the weapon of germs, particularly the smallpox virus, which was completely devastating to the indigenous population of the Americas. And these weapons ensured that trade occurred on terms which favoured the Europeans. OK, the second stage of exploitation that Frank identifies is... And here we're talking from about the 16th century to the early part of the 20th century. So what colonialism did was to formalise the exploitative relationships that had been established during the mercantile capitalism phase. So it involved European countries uh, establishing uh, overseas territories in the Southern Hemisphere. So eventually large parts of the Americas, of Asia, of Africa, eventually uh, became part of a bigger European empire. And colonialism had a massive impact on political systems, cultural systems, and the economy. So under colonialism, for example, uh, small farmers were kicked off the most fertile land, and these local farms were converted to produce the cash crops, things like rubber, sugar, coffee, tea, tobacco, which were needed by the European imperial powers. And there was a flourishing uh, trade in slaves during the colonial era. And the image that you can see here illustrates something called the slave triangle, where slaves were exported from West Africa to the Caribbean 
to work on European plantations. And during the colonial era, the local cottage industries often collapsed because they were simply unable to compete with the cheaper mass production of the colonial countries. And dependency theorists would argue that there are many parts of the developing world that have never really recovered from colonialism. So, for example, in 1994, in Rwanda, the ruling Hutu government set out to eradicate the Tutsi minority. And this appalling genocide at the time was explained as being almost incomprehensible by many sections of the Western press. However, in reality, it was at least in part a legacy of the divide and rule policies of the uh, Belgians when they ruled uh, Rwanda during the colonial era. Now eventually the colonies broke away from the Europeans and became independent nation states. However, for dependency theorists such as Frank, these new countries can never be truly independent. And that's why he uses this term neo-colonialism or new colonialism to describe the present day. And the argument here is that whilst the formal structures of colonialism have been removed, if we look at things a bit more closely, the same types of exploitation persist in the current era, even if it's not as obvious as it was during the colonial period. So the main argument is even though colonialism has collapsed, uh, in part due to popular uprisings, exploitation continues in the form of very unfair economic practices that work in the interests of rich countries and against the uh, interests of the former colonies. For example, it continues to be the case that the former colonies remain reliant on a few primary products such as cash crops and that leaves them very open and vulnerable to falling prices. And furthermore, these primary products are often processed in the north and then sold back to producers in poorer countries at vastly inflated prices. Another feature of this neo-colonial phase, according to dependency theory, is debt. So loans from the richer countries to the poorer countries forms an enormous debt burden, which ensures that the poorer countries remain dependent on the richer countries for things like aid and trade. So in summary, unlike modernization theory and neoliberalism, this is a perspective that focuses on the external causes of underdevelopment. And in a nutshell, this perspective argues that development and underdevelopment are two sides of the same coin. So rich countries have become wealthy on the backs of the poor. So in effect, this perspective is arguing that the developed countries, the richer countries of the north, have made the poorer countries poor, and it's in their interest to keep them poor by, using Ha Jun Chang's metaphor, kicking the development ladder away. Because if these countries remain poor and weak, then the richer countries can continue to steal their natural wealth and exploit their workers. Right, let's finish this presentation by looking at some evaluative points. And let's start by briefly considering some of the strengths of dependency theory. I guess the main thing to say about this perspective is it highlights some of the important external barriers to development. So rather than focusing on aspects of traditional societies that inhibit development, this perspective places more emphasis on rich countries putting their own house in order. And dependency theory has formed the basis for other types of Marxist theories of development such as Wallerstein's world system theory model, which is a little bit different to dependency theory. It's a free world model consisting of a core periphery, but also an intermediate group of nations known as the semi-periphery. And it's a more dynamic model of development than dependency theory, allowing for upward and downward social mobility. There are many criticisms though of dependency theory. For example, many sociologists working in the field of development argue that dependency theory, unlike other perspectives, doesn't really come up with any kind of practical solutions for underdevelopment. 
Another type of criticism is this idea that dependency theory overgeneralizes about the long-term negative impact of colonialism. So, for example, there are many countries that were formerly colonies, particularly in South Asia, that have been very successful in developing their economy. So in the case of South Asia, colonialism hasn't had a long-term negative impact on economic development. And the right-wing historian Niall Ferguson argues that there hasn't been enough attention paid to some of the long-term benefits of colonialism. For example, in his book Empire, Ferguson argues that Western medical advances in the 19th and 20th centuries increased life expectancies across the world, even in their colonies. And Ferguson argues that the French in particular in Western Africa uh, brought about significant improvements to public health, uh, developing effective vaccinations for diseases such as smallpox and yellow fever.